You guys in the back all hear me back there? <laughs> Good. So my name is Martin Stipout. I run Ventana Surfboards. Um, essentially what I do is I build hollow wooden surfboards. And I try to specialize in using mostly, if not all, reclaimed wood that I source locally. Um, my way of starting this whole endeavor, essentially, um, I've always built things. I grew up in South Africa and I kind of grew up around my dad building everything that we had um, and learning from that. Never really had the money to buy toys, so if I wanted something, I'd put it together out of whatever materials I could. And that's just kind of progressed throughout my entire life. Um, I studied marine biology in college, and after that I sailed with one of the folks in the audience here, <laughs> and we did uh, marine conservation and education for a number of years. One of the big focuses that we had was marine debris in the oceans, and that's always kind of also hit home. From there on, it just kind of, I started building, you know, I built a board for myself after I broke the last foam board that I had and was tired with working with foam. So I went out and got some plywood and just kind of put together a board in my backyard and it's the worst thing I've ever surfed, but it was the best thing I've ever built. And it kind of started from there. So I, um, I progressed, I built a few more boards and the shapes got a little bit better and I had a good time doing it. And then I had, you know, a random guy out in the lineup said, hey, would you mind building me a board? Sure, I'll build you a board. And it kind of started as that. There was more demand for it. And the, uh, the conservation education ended for me. And from there on, it was like, you know, the option I could go be a cable guy or do any of those other jobs that I really wasn't interested in or try to join the rest of the country in financial debt and start my own company. So that's what I did. <laughs> um, it's going pretty good as well. I, I ran Ventana with a business partner for the first two and a half years. Unfortunately, as many as you probably know, partnerships are really difficult and that just didn't work out, so we went our own ways, and I've been continuing doing this um, for the last year on my own now. And it's been pretty fun, you know, in the beginning we were just making wooden surfboards, and it just kind of didn't have, you know, it was always a little bit of, let's try to use reclaimed wood if we can, but that wasn't the big focus. And now I've shifted to, as I said, almost exclusively using reclaimed wood in some way. Now it might not be reclaimed as I'm literally picking it out of the dump, but it could be that cabinet shops just have small pieces or single pieces that they can't use anymore. But for me, it's excellent. You know, I build it into fins or tail blocks or anything like that if I don't have enough material to build a whole board. Um, so it's been pretty neat, and I've got a really good response from the community. I met, uh, met a gentleman a few years ago who he does construction, and he had access to the hardwood floors in an old Victorian mansion. You know, it was a mansion built in the 1880s. All the redwood was locally milled. It's all old-growth trees. I mean, there isn't a single lot in 1,800 board feet of lumber, which is a lot of lumber. And um, he kind of donated that to me in a little bit of an exchange. He's going to be surfing one of my boards pretty soon. Um, but that redwood is just really nice. You know, it has a whole story behind it. It was locally milled, and it was a floor in a house for 120 years. And just before it went to the dump, he had access to it, salvaged it all. And as he says, he was holding on to it for 10 years to meet me, and he passed it on. So it's been really nice kind of using all the old materials that are locally available and otherwise just go to the landfill. So redwood really has become one of my specialties because it is a beautiful wood, it's naturally rot resistant, it's light, it's easy to work with, and in this area, there's a plethora of it available. Um, I've used anything from fence boards to two by fours coming out of houses for remodels, floorboards, I just started building um, a lot of boards that has, have parts of a piano that was built in the late 1800s, and I disassembled that, took all the keys, and I'm doing ebony and ivory inlays. So it's been pretty neat. Um, I think the boards are wonderful surfboards. You know, Tyler has a couple of her, has surfed a bunch of them and has one of his own and they, they surf really well. It's nothing revolutionary. I'm not doing anything that hasn't been done before. You know, the, the type of construction that I'm doing is essentially it was started by Tom Blake, who was a paddleboarder in the in the late thirties. And he designed the first hollow paddleboard, which really gave him an edge over the guys using solid boards. So it's called the kook box construction. Essentially there's a center stringer that runs the full length of the board with cross ribs to support the decks. And from there on, the decks I'm putting on the board are about an eighth inch thick, so really thin. Keeps the boards nice and light and makes them really responsive. Um, as I said, it's not some revolutionary thing. It's not better than any other board. It's just different. They have a different feel to them when you surf them. They have a different look to them. For me, it's much more organic. I feel much more connected to the board, if that makes any sense for you. Um, so in that sense, you know, they are really fun boards to surf. They, they weigh a little bit more than a traditional foam board or a standard foam board. 
but then again it's also not necessarily I'm not shooting for a market of competition surfing where there's really aggressive maneuvers and aerials and things like that they're just great boards all around to surf I'd say probably 60 to 70 percent of them will never see the water if they're hanging on the wall uh, which is perfectly fine by me <laughs> um, so there's um, there is quite a bit to that. You know, I don't just build a normal surfboard with a bunch of redwood glued together. I try to put a little bit of heart into it and try to come up with random designs and, and unique things that I haven't seen done before. Um, so it is a challenge. You know, it's definitely a challenge trying to stay motivated to build something new and not just, as I said, put together a couple of boards and call it a day. Um, some of the boards, you know, I'll spend three days alone working on the center stringer because there's so many different cuts so many different glue jobs that I just have to wait for everything to dry and everything to come together. So building a surfboard takes me about a week and a half, two weeks for just the woodworking. Um, I'm starting, you know, I've started to do all the glassing myself as well in the last year and a half or so. And I'm exclusively using a bio resin, so it's 70% tree sap based. It's not perfect yet, but we're getting there. <coughs> um, one of the things that a lot of people ask is, I'm still using fiberglass. How's that? You know, involved with my ecological impact, essentially. Well, my belief is if you make something last longer and it's not disposable, it's not going into the landfill. And if it takes me to use fiberglass to make these boards more durable and last for many, many years, then that's an offset that I'm willing to make. Rather than trying to progress into not glassing my boards or skipping any of those steps, I'd rather have they be around by making a little bit more of an impact in the beginning. That's kind of the philosophy of buying a hybrid car. I mean, you spend more in the beginning, but in the end, it's going to save you a lot of money, and it's not going to go to the landfill. So in that sense, it's been, you know, it's been pretty good. Um, as I said, it is sometimes a challenge, because people look at the boards and they go, wow, you know, I wouldn't actually ever want to surf that. And then, you know, that's perfectly fine. Of course, they do come at a little bit of an increased price over a, a standard foam board, so that's definitely a setback for people. But everybody I know that does surf my boards, they, they absolutely love it. You know, they don't go out on a high tide day when there's 45 other people in the water and the waves are crashing against the rocks. You, know, you save it kind of for a nice day, for a special occasion. And I think that in the end, even the boards hanging on the wall in people's houses, at some point, somebody's grandson is going to say, you know what, Grandpa would want me to surf this. So at some point, they all go in the water. Um, I've had a lot of requests to build boards simply as wall hangers, not surfable. <coughs> skip a few steps, make them cheaper, etc. But I just don't do that. You know, all the boards I built are there are all the boards boards I build are built to surf, regardless of what happens to them in the end. Um, so that's been kind of fun. It's of course, you know, it's an evolution trying to get better and trying to do more positive things. Um, the next kind of step that I'm experimenting with is trying to get away from traditional fiberglass cloth. Um, I have a friend in Germany who actually is really into the whole composition of surfboards and he sourced a lot of natural materials, 100% cellulose fibers, which is essentially it's just plant material that turns completely clear. Um, if you use that with 100% bioresin, technically you can throw your board in the bonfire when you're done and there's nothing but plant on the ground. So it's pretty nice to also think about your, you know, what happens to my surfboard after it's done. With foam surfboards, I mean, with EPS foam, they are able to recycle it, but most of the standard polyester foam, it's just or polyurethane. There isn't anything you can really do with it unless you make small hand planes or smaller things out of that material. But recycling is really difficult. Um, my boards, I mean, there's, there's not much recycling after they're done. You know, it's, it's thin wood and you can't salvage too much. But as I said, they do last a very long time. Um, you live a kind of a non-traditional life. You didn't, like I said, you didn't go get a cable job. You didn't get a normal job. Who instilled that in you? Did it just happen? Did your parents do that for you? Um, how do you think that actually happened? Well, my parents were a huge encouragement. You know, they've never said, oh my gosh, what are you trying to do? You know, go along with your degree, do what you do. Um, they've always been really supportive of what I've been doing. As I said, you know, I've, I've built things for myself for the last probably 30 years, of my 34 years alive. So it's always, you know, they've known that I, I have a little bit of a knack for working with wood and different materials, so they were, they were really enforcing on that. Um, other than that, I mean, I don't really know. It's the only life I know, so <laughs> yeah, I can't compare it to a non-traditional or traditional life.